As being the executor of the estate or being the person helping the executor out with keeping track of the financials associated with the estate, you're going to need some form of ledger. From what I've found so far by searching the internet, I haven't found anything per se that collectively brings all this information together and keeps it in one uniformed way. So I created this for myself to use as me being an executor. And I'm offering this to you guys at a nominal price and that price is $10 and you'll find the link for this ledger inside of the description to this video. Now you can obviously make a ledger yourself if you have the skills and everything like that, but it's such a nominal charge. And the whole reason why I'm charging any fee at all is because eventually I'm going to need to contact lawyers and spend money with them on an hourly rate that I've talked about in other videos before, which is anywhere between three to 500 or even a thousand dollars an hour to ask questions associated with finding out information related to law handling and life planning. So it could be an estate attorney or a probate attorney, things like that. So that's really the only reason why I'm asking for anything at all associated with that. As you can see inside of this ledger, there are multiple tabs. I'm going to walk you through each one of them so you can kind of see how things work out and kind of give you a high level of what the purpose of each component of is related to this. At the end of the day, this ledger is used for keeping track of things during the process of the estate being open, giving reimbursements to people who lent out money before the estate account was created, as well as handling the inheritance, the taxes, and as well is if you have it where as you are starting to work through the estate process, say, you know what, I'm going to rent out the place for a little bit, or I'm going to rent it out indefinitely. It kind of gives you some general components that you need to think about as you're looking at doing the renting so you can keep track of these parts so that you can handle the bills and the expenses associated to it. So it's very, very basic, but something that you can at least get up from a high level and work through. We're going to start on this first tab here. This is the standard bills tab. This tab is designed for keeping track of the person's life expenses, not the expenses after they passed or their final expenses. So things like their cell phone, their mortgage, utilities, anything that would be going on in their life while they were alive that either you're going to be winding down or you're going to be taking over as part of the estate or transitioning to someone else as part of the inheritance and that someone needs to know about. So if we look at what is currently inside of here, you see Verizon uh, was their cell phone. Their name was Joe Smith. They had a phone number of 214-555-1212. John Smith, say you are John Smith, which was another person on it. That's 214-555-1314, and that's their cell phone, and that was a monthly charge of $143. So we're just going to add in to here monthly bill. Next, we have, say, their mortgage. Maybe this is from Citibank. This is their account number, and the address to Citibank Again, this is all fictitious stuff here. You'd have to look it up and include in things like their phone number, et cetera, as well. But obviously, that's the website. Um, their mortgage on 1313 Mockingbird Lane in Albany, New York, and it's 1659.37. We can add in as well, let's say Con Ed, and that is 46.35. 002 and one Con Ed Way, New York City, and then ConEd.com, and that's their electric bill. Monthly, and let's say it was 100 and eh, let's be more realistic. Let's say $250 a month. Again, this is just keeping track of it all so that you have it, and then you can work through so you can call the people up and disconnect it. This is just so you can have where you can call these companies up, either continue to work on paying them, make sure that you are a successor or another manager on the account, or have it where they're transitioned into your name or the person on it. 
or some other person's name on it. So, for example, say on Verizon, say it's Joe Smith, John Smith, and say uh, Janet Smith. Janet is going to have it where it's going to go into her name initially um, as part of the transition, and she will become the owner of the cell phone plan with John and um, Janet uh, still left while Joe's phone will either be kept on for a certain period of time or eventually disconnected or just kept on in perpetuity that might be transitioned to someone else at a later time. That goes over at standard bills. The next three tabs over work in heavy unison with each other throughout the course of the yearly process associated with taxes, reimbursements, and things like that, while the next one is dealing with inheritance, which we'll get to that one in a little bit. So I'm going to start at the ledger one over here, and then I'll go to reimbursements, and I'll toggle back between each of these so you can see the differences between it all. There are different columns inside of the ledger in order to do different descriptions and categories associated with everything that is going on. This tab, you have all of the various different categories as well as the breakdown of deposits, expenses, and liabilities associated out with the estate. Remember, at the end of the day, as the executor or the one helping the executor with the finances, you are going to be working through to break down or wind down the estate as an overall. Understanding the right categories allows you to handle the taxes for the final tax year for the person, as well as potentially additional tax years while the estate is winding down. And after that first tax year or the, la the final taxes under their social security number, you then will have it where you will be filing taxes under the estate's EIN number or employer identification number that you will obtain that will be related to the estate after finishing the probate process and getting the letter of administration or letter of testimony to create that estate account. These categories here are all of the standard categories that one may need to handle while working through the estate in order to break them down in order to be able to work effectively with a CPA, a estate attorney, or a tax attorney of some kind, as well as to keep track of things just in case of anything that might come about. The components down here allow you to keep track of things over year over year basis so that you can see about deposits, expenses, liabilities, networking capital, etc. as you're working through the different components. And the aspect with this is that it's monies that are inflows that have entered into the quote unquote estate versus that are still left and are remaining from different accounts that have not been transferred yet into the official estate. So you might have it where there are funds that are coming from life insurance policies or brokerage accounts or selling of homes or what have you. Those are not taken into account throughout the course of this ledger until they are actually deposited into the cash account of the estate itself and worked through for paying off bills. There's things you would keep track of separately and on the sidelines because you might have it where it might take you months or years before you were able to bring those funds in. So this is, again, this whole ledger is about working through and getting through the process of tracking what you know is officially part of the estate versus not officially part of the estate. And parts of that could include funds that you might be working with beneficiaries to try to get into the estate accounts to help fund them, like life insurance or an annuity, and bring them in to pay bills. Those are not officially classified as being estate funds until everybody that agreed to it or those particular people agreed to put them back into the estate and have it where afterwards they don't have to be reimbursed or they will be reimbursed according to the terms of the trust or of the will itself versus what they were named inside of a particular account. You will see components such as 
liabilities, networking capital in here. Liabilities are monies that were borrowed from other people, like their life insurance, like their inherited or their beneficiary life insurance or annuity funds put in to the account. Or as you can see in different categories, such as here, a potentially a rental security deposit that might have been issued and then being used temporarily to fund part of the estate while working on other parts to pay it back. Because at the end of the day, a, a rental security deposit is not a state funds it's associated with that particular property itself then you also have networking capital there's comments here related to this but at the end of the day this is really about what could be used for funds after paying the expenses and the liabilities and everything else back and forth and you can see how that works out over here and over the course of time this is uh, the cumulative networking capital as it goes through the years and you're supposed to have it as you're going through it to have this eventually zero out it being negative initially makes sense because the fact is that you are going to be working for a while to retrieve funds associated with the person if you do not have it where things are in an estate and things are all based on a will and trying to go through the probate process so you're gonna to need to have things being funded from other people potentially. So how do these categories work a little bit more in detail? We'll go through the ledger aspect on this and then go through the other tabs. So if we come back over to the ledger, you see that monies that came from Joe's checking account were deposited into the estate. This is because the monies were then transferred into the estate of Joe or another account that was joint owned by the executor or a family member in order to pay for funds so that it's out of that primary account. Because as we talked about, there's that whole thing related to fun, um, accounts potentially getting locked, closed, or frozen and you want to get some of those funds out potentially and go it into a separate account that you as the executor or somebody working from the family to work on to handle that. So in this case, you have it where those were deposited in, those were estate funds, they were, it was 60,000. 60, those are estate funds that are being deposited. So that's a one here and that basically, and that took care of that. On this one here, it was funeral costs, so it's the category of burial and funeral, final expenses. At the time, there was no money from Joe coming in, so it was thirty-five thousand. It was paid, not it wasn't deposited into a account associated with the estate. It was just paid directly for those costs. Were the um, were the estate funds at the time? No, those were paid by the executor. So that's how you come up with thirty-five thousand over there, and then you can see how these parts break down. So you have it where there's funds in the estate account after this line item of 60,000, there's a negative 30,000 because it was paid by the executor. The actual balance is a total of 25,000 because it's 60 minus 35, which yields out 25 if you pay back the executor fully. And then projected is 9,400, which we'll see in a few seconds when we look at the reimbursement component. You have uh, Jack depositing in, um, monies from their life and uh that are claimed from life insurance monies so that's fifteen thousand. was it a state fund no because it is something that jack is giving to the estate temporarily and you will attempt to try to give that money back to jack after everything is all taken care of so that means that now you have it where the estate funds are now at seventy five thousand. 50,000 because it's 35 plus 15 that are from outside money. Um, and you continue going down the line, you see all those. Now you have it where you got a mortgage payment, mortgage payment, um, category is mortgage. You have it where it's 16, 59, 37, which comes from the standard bills. Was that paid with state funds? Yes, which is one. And you now see a deduction off of that amount. You now decide to go pay Jack back some of his initial um, deposit into the estate, which is part of that 15000 So you pay him back 5000 The withdrawal is from estate funds, yes. And is it being withdrawn for reimbursement? Yes. Who's it going to, Jack? Now you see the 
withdrawal here, and you see that now the outside monies is now reduced by 15. Same thing with the executor, paying uh, the executor back 20,000 and moving forward on that. And that all comes down to this tab here, the estate reimbursement amounts, where now you see that the initial amount that was owed was 35,000, but the remaining amount that still needs to be paid back to the executor or Jack or whomever is over here. These totals of this amount, as well as these amounts here, which is you just keeping track of different amounts that you know are coming about in the future that need to get paid back or need to get expensed because they're not official yet, they might vary. That is what comes into this 40,600, which is what makes up the how we come up with this balance here, a projected balance, because the fact is we're dealing with potential future balance or future expenses that are known at this time. Now, at the end of the process or during the middle of the process, the executor is going to start to work on paying out inheritance. That is done with assets within the estate, which is associated to property, cars, uh, bank accounts, what have you, and breaking them down from things that are of an intrinsic value. Over here, we have the different percentages of the different people that might have been classified in the will or the trust of beneficiaries. So it's their percentages, which should equal 100. And then you have it where this amount is the amount that's to be divided. This amount comes from whatever is the amount inside of the actual cash in the account or the accounts of the estate, as well as the, um, the net value of the properties because or, or the assets. And that's because the home might be appraised at say 150,000, but there's a mortgage of 115. That means that the net value is only 35,000 because you have to pay back the mortgage. If the car is not supposed to be uh, retitled to a specific beneficiary directly and just be sold, then that's additional monies that would be um, handled or if it's agreed on that it'll just go to someone. That's how this part goes about being calculated. Now, you'll notice that there are two columns. There's an estate, inherited estate, um, sorry, inheritance. There's inheritance uh, estimate that can be frozen and then vari variance estimate, which is a running one. This is because the fact that over the course of the estate time frame, the executor might have it where it might do a partial payment at one time and then a remaining one later down the line. So this is the amount that is being calculated initially because of all the funds that are associated with the account and doing a first run. Now, there is nothing that keeps track of, oh, this was paid out or not. Literally, the only way to really keep track of that is to say, okay, I'm going to put a cross outline on this one by going into format cell and do a strike through to say you paid it. So it's not saying that that goes to zero because it's always being handled. But all that, at least in this particular version, what happens is that you say, okay, there is these funds here. And this is because at the particular time, oops, So at the particular time we had, the reason why you see it's frozen inheritance, that's because if we have it where we say take out the inheritance listing out right here, so where we're paying out all of these inheritance amounts, we'll just delete them for right now. We come back over to inheritance and you will see the um, amount that is being handled. So initially it was this. We are going to just have it where we set it back to H3. No, sorry, H4. And you see these amounts being listed out here. Okay. Now that means that as far as inheritance goes, that's what we should be paying out, and this is the amounts that are being handled across the board with the particular person. Now, we say that we're going to pay out um, 50000 right now because we're expecting additional stuff and we have extra funds to handle this. So 
what we'll now do is we will say, okay, instead of leaving this, we are going to now lock in the frozen amount and let this one vary out, which means that from this point forward, that amount will vary um, and that the this one to be divided will now take the place of whatever is left in the ledger versus taking into, and it'll discount or remove this amount, which was already paid out. So we'll say lock this one down and we'll say that this one is 50,470.63. So that's now locked out. And you can see that this is a runner of a balance of zero because there's nothing else available inside of the ledger. And that's because of different parts that are coming in. And that's because we have these parts that were listed out on it. So we'll take this out for right now, go back over just to clean this part up. And you'll see that it actually really should have been 4474063. There you go. That's now locked in, which is what we saw before. And now what we'll do is we will now pay off the these amounts to the different beneficiaries. And in that case, we will go over here. So each of the payouts are as follows, 14764.41, 14764.41, paid with estate funds, And then fourteen, and then one forty nine fourteen, so that's now been handled, and you can see that there's like a, a penny left over, and that's because in reality, or two pen, two cents left over, and that's because this whole third component. So what we're really going to do is we're just going to. Um, we're gonna come over here and say, well, Dylan, each of um, Kim and Devin are only gonna get 13 cents versus 14 cents because of the rounding issue that occurs. So even though that this is what it is, remember these numbers are being rounded, uh, rounded up, and there's a little bit of a penny difference that'll go. So some person's gonna get an extra penny, potentially when you have these 0.333s um, occurring. So you have to take that into account. But now we have it where we come back in and, okay, we now have um, a, a new deposit of, say, $3,000 in each of, for rental incomes that come in. Obviously, that's estate funds that are coming. Now what happens is on the inheritance, there's now $6,000 additional that potentially could be. So now you're doing another breakdown. This last one is related to, okay, after you've now done this, there's now running totals for later. And you're now doing the final one on this. And remember, as I said before, there's nothing to keep track that this was paid in, out or anything. So the only way to really do this right now is to just go through and format the cells and mark them with a strike through and cross them off that you paid them. Again, this ledger is a very simple, basic one to keep track of things. There's no fancy bell whistles or anything like that. It's just something very basic to keep you working through the process. Additionally, there is this rental breakdown tab. This rental breakdown tab is if you have it where you decide instead of selling the place, you are going to rent it out. This kind of helps you keep track of things a little bit better as you're working through everything. So. You believe that you want to rent the place out for say 3000, say the HOA is 300 taxes are 13. Um, there's a mortgage that's 500. You have your insurances, all those components. And then this tells you the estimated expenses. And then this is the minimum um, amount of rent to, um, that needs to be available so that it covered the bare minimum of the expenses, which leads to the fact of what the remaining rent then equals out to over the course of time. So that basically, um, because you are now taking the fact that there's potentially going to be some amount that you need to have for repair. So it's saying, look, 
you're charging 3000 your minimum based on all of these components is this amount so you can see that it, uh, this part here is really just a helper just to make sure that everything made sense and that you were working through just trying to leave some um, aspect it's like did this really help you cover things you have to know that's all that this is really doing it's nothing anything beyond that and you can see that because the rent was three thousand your monthly expenses are fifteen seventeen you now have the remaining rent which can go toward paying out potentially beneficiaries or other components is fourteen eighty three a month that's a possibility but at the end of the day remember you're still paying for estate expenses for a bit and you don't want to have it where you pay out the beneficiaries of the will or anything else until after you have things under control. That's even why you have the super fee or the uh, superintendent fee. If you're, say, the executor and you're acting as a super, you're entitled to an amount because you're acting as the landlord and the super for it, you're entitled to, say, 392. But you could be paying off aspects of the estate components and you might not be doing that initially. Again, that's why there's a total down here saying, look, there was $6,000 of rental income. The super fee should be seven eighty three. dollars It's not saying that this was paid or not. It is just saying that that's what should have been done in some form. So that way you can keep track of it. And then that way you can say, okay, did I take, um, did I give any funds yet to the super? as part of expenses yet. And if you did, then awesome. If you did not, then you now need to start accounting for that and start paying those components out. And that would be um, another line item to keep track of and work through those components, okay? And then once you start doing that and say you have it where you're now doing that on a regular basis, Awesome. You can just have this as just some note factor and then work off on that. Anyway, that's the ledger. Hopefully it's helpful and hopefully you get some benefit from this. Again, at the end of the day, I'm only asking for $10 for this and that's to help pay for eventually lawyer fees and other um, components I might need for doing research. And Again, this should help you to have a general working breakdown of components as you're working through the estate. As always, like, subscribe, and share this video with anyone that you think might be able to benefit from this information.